60 Minutes Rewind. Two years ago, Terry Schiavo sparked a nationwide debate when she was removed from a feeding tube. Schiavo was in a permanent vegetative state with no chance of recovery. But there are as many as 300,000 other Americans who've survived brain injuries only to be trapped in what's called a minimally conscious state. They can't talk or walk or eat, but they retain more mental awareness than vegetative patients. For decades now, minimally conscious people have been all but ridden off by the medical establishment, warehoused in nursing homes with little hope of recovery. But as you'll see tonight, incredible new discoveries are changing the way doctors view these people. It turns out some may have been misdiagnosed and may be more aware than previously thought. What's even more surprising is that after receiving the popular sleeping pill Ambien, some minimally conscious people are actually waking up. We begin with the remarkable story of a man named Don Herbert. Don Herbert was a firefighter in Buffalo, New York. On December 29, 1995, he was battling a house fire when the building's roof collapsed. Don was trapped under a pile of debris and nearly suffocated. A local news camera captured firefighters pulling Don from an attic window. By the time his wife Linda and four sons reached the hospital, Don was already in a coma. I remember pleading and begging with him in the hospital when he was unresponsive, just, you know, don't leave me, don't leave the kids, you know, we need you, you know, we need you. You try to get him to squeeze your hand or move a toe or something like that, it just, we were looking for just about anything. Don Herbert did regain consciousness, but a few months later slipped into a minimally conscious state. He could respond to some stimuli, but was unable to communicate. Moved to a nursing home, he was kept alive by a feeding tube. I took him to one neurologist, and I was basically begging him, you know, to tell me, is he going to get better or isn't he? And he just sort of said, well, look at him. What do you see? You see what I see. There's nothing there. And I was just devastated. While Don languished in the nursing home, years passed, and his four boys grew into men. Determined to keep their father in their lives, Linda brought Don to birthdays and holidays, but says he sat slumped in his wheelchair, unaware of his surroundings. What was it like as a kid growing up I mean, to see your dad like that? You'd think after 10 years of seeing him hooked up to feeding tubes and different machines that you'd sort of get used to it or something, but you're, I really never did it. Yeah, it made me sick to my stomach to go. You know, I didn't go that often because I just couldn't stand seeing him like that. Then one day, two years ago, the nursing home called with shocking news. Don had woken up and was asking for his family. How long have you been doing? One of the nurses lent the Herberts a video camera to record Don's incredible awakening. His first words were a struggle. He hadn't spoken in nearly a decade. <laughs> Family members and buddies from the firehouse rushed to Don's room. Blinded in the accident, Don recognized everyone by their voice. Everyone, that is, except his youngest son, Nick, who was just four when his dad was injured. That's Nick holding your right hand. Right here. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did he understand who you were? He still thought that I was really young, and he went to... Uh, like put his hand out over me and uh, to see how, like, how tall I was. And like, we just kept telling him to raise his hand higher because he was trying to feel for me down low. How long have I been calling? Quite a while, pal. Quite a while. Ten. Ten years. When he learns that he's been gone for ten years, I mean, he seems heart sick about it. Oh, yeah. You can, the sadness is palpable. He felt so bad. He thought like he had abandoned us. He felt so bad that he wasn't there for the boys. Did it feel like an opportunity to say stuff that you never thought you would have? Yeah. Here's my chance to really tell him about me and, you know, try to make him feel proud. Don Herbert's reunion with his family was brief. While trying to get out of bed, he fell and suffered another brain injury. He later contracted pneumonia and less than a year after he woke up, Don Herbert died. His awakening was celebrated as a miracle, and a family member has now written a book about it being released on Tuesday. But What's Dr. Nicholas on? Schiff, a neurologist at Weill Cornell Medical here, Center, says though rare, he's seen here, other startling recoveries and believes Don Herbert's story should be a wake-up call for doctors. When I went to medical school like 20 years ago, there were very 
various kinds of one-liners you get in medical school about you know ways ways of understanding a problem, and the, and the one-liner you get about brain injury was damage done. That you know, the, what's done is done. What's done is done. Structural brain injury is unchanging. So with people in, with patients in a minimally conscious state, it's not true to say what's done is done. I think we know enough now to know that there are some minimally conscious state patients where that statement is false. Dr. Schiff believes Don's awakening may have been triggered by a Parkinson's drug his doctor gave him. What's even more remarkable is that another drug has recently been shown to have similar effects on some minimally conscious people. The case of George Melendez is perhaps the most dramatic of all. George suffered brain injury when he crashed his car into a pond and nearly drowned. Weeks after the accident, doctors told his mother, Pat Flores, her son would never get better. What you see lying there in the bed is as good as it gets. They said that's as good as it gets. That's as good as it gets. He's never going to be able to do anything. He is a vegetable. Hey, honey, wake up for me. Wake up. George was in a minimally conscious state, but for years, Pat was determined to reach him. Georgie, look at me. She cared for him at home while searching for new treatments. Are you tired? Do you think George was always in there, unable to communicate, sort of trapped? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. One night in 2002, unable to sleep because of his moaning, Pat gave George Ambien, a common sleeping pill used by millions of people. I noticed the room got quiet, and in my mind I'm thinking, wow, that pill's really good, it really knocked him out. And when I looked over, instead of seeing a sleeping George, I saw a very much awake George with his eyes wide open and just scanning the room and looking. Are you sleeping? Not at all? Some sleeping medication. Huh? For the first time in five years, Pat heard her son speak. Hey, Georgie, can you say the word no? No. There you go. <laughs> your voice. I love your voice. The next day, sensing she was on the verge of a breakthrough, Pat gave George another dose of Ambien through his feeding tube. George's stepfather taped the transformation. So remember this face because you won't see it for a couple of hours. Within six minutes, George went from being unresponsive, moaning and shaking, to quiet, alert, and answering questions. Yep, George is there. Hi. Hi, baby. What, what kind of questions did you ask him? If he knew where he was at, if he knew what had happened to him, if he was in pain. Um, and, and was he in pain? No, he said no. He said no clearly, which that was a big relief. Pat doesn't know why the Ambien works, but she's been giving it to George every day now for the last five years. You see this thing? What's that called? Uh, 60 Minutes helped arrange for George to see Dr. Schiff of Cornell. He performed exams to see if George's reaction to Ambien is real or just his mother's wishful thinking. Lift your head, sweetie. First, Dr. Schiff did a PET scan of George's brain off Ambien. The frontal lobe, the area responsible for behavior and language, was yellow, indicating greatly reduced brain activity. We're just going to go over here. Mom's going to come with us. The next day, after he was given Ambien, George was put back in the scanner. The frontal lobe, seen earlier in yellow, was now bright red. Well, that's impressive. Yeah. That's a twofold difference. Yeah. So we've just learned something here. Today's scan looks like it's about two or three times as intense metabolically. That's like a big deal. His brain is turned on with this stuff. Have you seen Ambien work on other patients? I have. And about a year and a half ago, I would have said no. Really? And now I've seen at least three cases. And do you think there are more people out there who could benefit? I think you're going to find a, a subset of patients who respond to it. The story will continue after this. What kind of pitch is that? Oh, Curveball, cool. Right. Other ambient sure awakenings something? have been reported around the world, okay. and the medical community is taking one. notice. Touch the comb, Jimmy. Here it is. There are several clinical trials of Ambien underway, but progress is slow, in part because minimally conscious people are scattered around the country in homes and nursing facilities, often far from research centers. Another obstacle to treating these people is that they're frequently misdiagnosed, said to be in a vegetative state, a more severe condition considered hopeless after the first year. There have been some recent studies looking to see what the misdiagnosis rate was, and uh, they come up with a number of 40 percent. So uh, the, the number of patients who were said to be in a vegetative state who may actually be in a minimally conscious state 
could be as high as 40%, 20, 30, 40%. In some, in some, some context. Studies. Why were people misdiagnosed? I mean, what's hard to catch? You have to examine them repeatedly and at different times of the day, and sometimes just changing a patient's posture or giving them a tendon massage may change their level sufficiently to elicit some response. And so that, yeah, this is an evolving area of understanding. Dr. Adrian Owen, a neuroscientist from the Medical Research Council in Cambridge, England, thinks new technology may help diagnose these people earlier and more accurately than a bedside exam. Last year, he stunned the scientific world when he discovered that a woman who met the diagnostic criteria for being vegetative could actually respond to a command with her mind. To illustrate his study, Owen did a functional MRI scan of my brain to show how it activates when I imagine playing tennis. Uh, imagine you're on the center court at Wimbledon, hitting that ball, left hand, right hand, uh, forehand, backhand, whatever. Within minutes, the computer rendered a three-dimensional image of my brain. So this is, this is my brain while I'm thinking about playing tennis? That's right. This region across here is, is known as the motor cortex. This area has turned on uh, in response to you imagining moving your arm around. That's incredible. Well, I can show you what happened uh, in our patient uh, who'd been diagnosed as vegetative. The motor cortex is almost in exactly the same place as in your brain, and it activates in almost exactly the same way when she imagines playing tennis. What was that moment like when you realized, wait a minute, she's actually responding to what I'm saying, she's in there? It was an absolutely stunning moment because we had no way of knowing beforehand that not only was she not vegetative, she was entirely consciously aware. Someone like Terry Schiavo would not have had brain activity that would have shown up in a functional MRI. No, there are many differences between patients uh, uh, like Terry Schiavo and the, the patient that we scanned. Um, the first thing is um, the type of brain damage. I want you to close your eyes, stick out your tongue, and give me a thumbs up. Good. <laughs> Excellent. As for George Melendez, Dr. Schiff says he's progressed so much he's no longer minimally conscious but severely disabled. Pat Flores has increased George's ambient dosage and is hopeful her son will continue to improve. But she remains a realist. I'm not going to get the old George back. I'm not that naive and that much in denial to think that I'm going to get 100% of who George was at one time. But hopefully it will be a George that will be able to live on his own and have a productive life. That's what you want? Yes. And you think that's very possible? It's possible. <laughs>